A good way to get an estimate of our test error is to use cross-validation. In a sense, cross-validation is going to construct an additional training test split over our already split uh, training data set. The split of the training data into uh, a further training and what's really actually called a validation data set um, can be done repeatedly to get a more accurate estimate. And this is what is the process of cross-validation. Uh, here I'm going to walk through how we do this cross-validation using scikit-learn, which actually has built-in tools to uh, run cross-validation. Um, in fact, it has uh, the, the k-fold uh, class, which will make it really easy to construct the splits of our training data set into subsequent training and validation sets. I should note that some of the models we will use later in this class have built-in cross-validation support, so the things you might tune about those models um, automatically get cross-validated on the training data set you pass when calling the fit function but it's good to know how cross-validation works. Now I should also add that the thing we're about to do, we're going to use cross-validation to estimate our training error. There's actually a built-in function for doing that in scikit-learn as well, um, but I wanted to show you how to actually implement cross-validation or the cross-validation procedure to give a bit better understanding of how cross-validation works. So to get started, we're going to use the, the k-fold class in the uh, model selection package uh, of scikit-learn. Um, and we're going to use that to implement a function, as I just said, that will construct the root mean squared error um, validation or cross-validation estimate for a given model. And so I'm going to walk through how this function works or how, how we implement this function. Um, and hopefully that will give you a better understanding of, of the process of cross-validation. Now the first thing we do in this function is we're going to take the model and we're going to clone it. The reason we want to do this is that when we pass in the model as an argument um, and then use that model in the cross-validation procedure, we're going to actually manipulate the state of that model. In particular, we're going to call fit uh, repeatedly. And so if there were weights attached to that model or parameters attached to that model that we had already fit in some earlier uh, process, we don't want to lose those. Um, and we, in, we want the, mo the, the function to behave as though the model is passed in not by reference, but by value. Um, and so to do that, we're going to take the model and we're going to clone it. Um, cloning is a function in scikit-learn base, but uh, cloning is actually a procedure where you take a, a deep copy of this model to create a new model. Which means when we do anything to this new model, we are no longer going to be modifying the model that was passed in. Uh, we, uh, I'll show you what this looks like in a moment. All right, so now we've made a copy of our model. Uh, we're going to use the k-fold class to do cross-validation. Here we specify how many ways we want to split our data set, our training data. So we're going to split it five ways. Uh, and I'm going to maintain an array of the error constructed, or the error, the, the validation error from each of those splits. Uh, and then when I'm done, I'm going to return the average of the, these uh, errors for each of the splits. So here's the body of the, the key part of the, the, the bulk of the cross-validation procedure right here. Um, and so I'm taking the five-fold class and I'm passing it my training data and, and I'm saying split that training data. And that's going to create an iterator where it's going to return pairs of train, training indices and validation indices, which I can then use to index into my uh, training data set. So uh, this, will, this for loop will run five times. So the length of this, this list when we're done should be length five. And on each of those runs, we're going to take the training data. We're going to get the, the uh, locations in our training data specified by the training index um, as our x, this is our input, our x values. Um, we're going to get the y values at those locations as well, at the training index locations. And then we're going to fit the model. And in this case, the model is a pipeline, so it's going to fit the entire pipeline. The, the feature functions, the imputation procedure, and so on will all be fit on this subset of the training data, right here and right here. Um, and then we're going to construct the root mean squared error by making predictions. So I did this all in one line, so let's unpack this line. So we're going to make a prediction on the validation locations. So we take the training data and the locations that were the, in the validation set. Uh, we're going to make a prediction for those and we're going to measure the error relative to the observed miles per gallon at the validation locations. We'll compute the root mean squared error and then we append that to our list of uh, root mean squared error values. And as I said before, when we return or the function is going to return 
the average of the root mean squared error values across each of our five validation splits. All right, so that's the function. Let's go here for a second. Um, I just want to show you what, what happens with my, my model. So I have a model that I've already trained. Uh, that's my model. Um, we just to, to get an idea, we'll, we'll look at the linear uh, model stage. We called it right here. It was called linear model. Okay, so we'll get the linear model stage, with that pipeline. And then we have coefficients attached to that stage. Uh, oops, sorry. One more. Coef. Yep. There we go. Sorry. So I have coefficients attached to stage. These are the weights of that model. Um, I, I wanted to make a copy so that when I run this procedure, which will repeatedly fit this model again and again for different splits, um, I don't lose these coefficients. We'll go ahead and run this procedure. Um, and that what it returned was our validation error. So this is an estimate of the uh, estimate of what the test error might be uh, for this model um, without actually ever looking at the test error. Uh, and just to, as a point, so my model here, uh, just copy this line here, my model's weights haven't been modified, so this should be the same weights as before. See, So I, I didn't affect the model, even though I retrained it many times inside this procedure. Well, I retrained it five times inside this procedure. All right, so we can delete this. Delete this. All right, so we've trained our model. Um, I've written a function here to plot uh, each of the models, so it's going to take compute the training error for each of the models in my dictionary um, by, by uh, evaluating the uh, models um, that have already trained. So I train each of these models on the training data set. Um, so I'm going to predict the training error here and take the RMSE. Um, I'm also going to construct the validation error by calling this cross-validation function for each of the models. And I'm also going to construct the test error by calling my uh, each of the models on the test data set. So I'm making predictions for uh, the test data. All right, so this can make a plot, and so now I can compare my models. So this is a picture of my training, validation, and test error. Uh, and we see that the, the validation error is a little bit higher than the, uh, the training error, not a whole lot of higher. Um, and I, I guess as we get, uh, or well, if we compare the test error, which is quite a bit higher, um, as we get further along in the modeling process, we get models that get closer and closer um, in training uh, and, and test error. Also, we notice that the training error is going down as we're improving our models. And likewise, the validation and test error are also going down. So, so far, the, the feature engineering we've been doing has, uh, has actually been improving the model. OK, so now uh, we've seen a reduction uh, in error. Let's continue to improve our model a bit further. So we could first try adding the model year. So we'll do that here. So we've added the model year to our set of features. Uh, and let's see what we get. So now we've got model year. Uh, we, we took this model uh, and, and fit it to our training data set. And we can again compare our models. So adding the model year had a big impact in the overall uh, accuracy. Um, in fact, so if we look again at the training error, it went down quite a bit. Um, and uh, the, the test error actually went below the training error. Now this can happen just because of variation in our training and test data set. So it's not always the case that the test error will be higher than the training error. Um, but it, it, the training error is typically an underestimate of the test error. Um, notice the validation error is slightly higher uh, than the, the training error. All right. So. Can we go further? Uh, we talked about in the previous lecture uh, how we could model features that are text. So let's try to do that now. We'll use the count vectorizer, and we'll apply that to the names of each of the, um, the, the vehicles. So here I'm adding an additional column to the select columns stage. And this additional column is going to take a, uh, apply a count vectorizer. Um, and it's going to be applied to the name column. Um, as before, I keep my imputation and my linear model. Um, this will be my most advanced model yet. And again, I will fit this model on the training data. And now I can compare models once more. And now we see something interesting. So we saw that as we uh, increased our model complexity, we added more features uh, all the way to the year, we saw this continuous reduction in the training error. 
um, and the subsequent uh, validation and test errors. So in all of these cases, the validation and test errors are also going down. Um, by adding the model, the vehicle name in, we, had, we continue to see a big reduction in training error, but now we see a jump up, an increase in the, the validation and test errors. So this model is probably our best model so far, and at this point we started to overfit. So now there are strategies we could use to restrict how we deal with the names. So right now we're feeding the entire name text in. We might instead maybe just look for brand names, uh, or we might just look for uh, the, the column uh, where the car is manufactured. We could use that categorical variable instead of maybe the name, and that might be a better, more uh, reliable signal when making future predictions on the fuel economy of vehicles. I also want to note here that we did go ahead and render the test error on all of these different models. When we are done, it is okay to go ahead and look at this test error. Now, at this point, if we were to make decisions based on this, this uh, more, uh, I made the test error a little bit transparent. If we were to make decisions based on this test error column, um, it would no longer be test error, it would be more like a validation error. Uh, and so we'd really want to collect more test error to, event, or to prevent ourselves from overfitting. Um, but when we're done, we can look at it and we can say, all right, well, the, the test error did go down. The, we, we chose the model based on, on this red column, the validation error. This is the model we decided to ship. Um, and, and we were probably, you know, we could say if we're less than, than three miles per gallon off in our, in our uh, RMSE, that's probably a pretty reasonable model uh, for predicting fuel economy based on characteristics of a vehicle. Now, if we were done the training process, at this point, we might take the best model. This is the model we, we trained here. And we'd like to train it on all of the data, not just the training and the test data. Um, and this would be the model we might want to, to ship. Uh, so let, let's try to do that really quickly. Um, so we'll do it at the bottom notebook here. So uh, we, we saved all of our models. The best model uh, had the name uh, right here, C plus D uh, plus D over C plus H. Uh, plus W plus A plus Y. That was our best model. So let's make a copy of it. So we don't want to modify the original best model. Um, so we use the clone function. Um, and now we're going to train, retrain this best model once more. So we take the best model um, and we'll do fit and we'll pass it all of our data. That's training and test data. We'll need the miles per gallon column as our Y value. So now we fit the model and now we've uh, made, we've taken our best model and trained it on everything. Uh, and we can uh, go ahead and try to evaluate on the test data. You'll notice that the error is going to be much lower because we did, in fact, train it on the test data. So it is no longer test data. Um, so we can look at that. So we take the RMSE of our best model um, and we'll do predict on uh, the test data. And we'll look at uh, test data, and we'll look at the uh, test MPG. G is our, is our uh, this is what we observed. Uh, and now we get a, a really low error, 2.81, um, what we see here. So we saw uh, 3.04, um, 2.86. So now once we trained against the test data, it did go down. But this is no longer test data, so we can't take this estimate as our estimate of the test error because we trained this best model on our test data. Okay, so that is the, the, the end of the notebook on training and test split and cross-validation. Uh, in our next set of lectures, we'll talk about how we can use regularization as a mechanism to control overfitting. We will use cross-validation to determine how much regularization we need. And then we'll try to analyze more formally what is going on as we overfit.